Hello friends! My name is Cindy and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And today we are going to finish our reading of Who Was Harriet Tubman? And that is by Yona Zeldis McDonough. Are you ready? Chapter 6, A Country at War. In 1861, civil war broke out between the northern and southern states. There were many reasons for the war. One of them was slavery. The South wanted to keep its slaves. People in the North wanted to end slavery throughout the United States. So the South decided to secede or pull away from the North. The 11 Southern states formed their own army. They called themselves the Confederate States of America. The North didn't want the South to secede. The North went to war to make the Southern states rejoin the Union, which is what the North called itself. And here are the two different flags. This is the Confederate and this is our flag. John Andrew, the governor of Massachusetts, asked Harriet to work for the Union Army. Andrew had heard Harriet speak. He knew about her life as a slave. He knew about her work on the Underground Railroad. He believed she could help the Northern cause. Here was another way for Harriet to work for freedom. She said yes. The first thing she did was travel to Port Royal Island off the coast of Southern South Carolina. Thousands of Northern soldiers were stationed there waiting to fight. So were thousands of runa runaway slaves. By law, the slaves were not yet free, but they wanted to join the Northern Army. They wanted to help fight for their freedom. But there were problems. The slaves still thought and acted like slaves. They expected white soldiers to give them orders. They were not used to thinking or acting like free men. That's where Harriet came in. She taught the soldiers to work with the slaves. And here's a picture of the camp. Harriet also helped black women. She taught them how to make things that they could sell. She helped them find ways to earn a living as free people in the North, not as slaves in the South. Many of the slaves in Port Royal were sick or hurt. Often their owners had wounded them trying to prevent their escape. The hospital was set up for them on the island, and this is the hospital. Harriet became a nurse. She cleaned wounds. She put cool cloths on the foreheads of patients with high fevers. Flies buzzed around the wounded patients all day. Harriet shooed them away. Some of the patients had dysentery. Dysentery caused horrible stomach cramps. Most people who caught it died. Harriet remembered the medicines from certain roots and herbs her mother used to make. Would they help her patients? Harriet wanted to find out. She went to the woods and gathered water lilies and pulled up their roots. She hunted for crane's bill. She boiled these plants into a strong brew. This is the two plants. There was a man dying of dysentery. Harriet gave him some of the brew to drink. In a few days, the man began to get better. People thought it was another of Harriet's miracles. If she was at your bedside, you would not die. The war dragged on into 1862 and beyond. For a while, it seemed as if the South would win. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers, both Northern and Southern, were wounded or killed. Still, neither side would give in. The bloody fighting continued. In 1863, President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves in the Confederate States. There's a picture of Abraham Lincoln. Southern black men could join the Northern Army. They formed their all-black regiment regiments. They had wanted to help the Union cause, and now they could. Still, the war did not end. Along with the black regiments, there was a new role for Harriet. Colonel James Montgomery asked if she could be a scout for his black troops. And here's a picture of Montgomery. In effect, he was asking her to be a spy. Harriet was the perfect choice. As a small black woman, she looked harmless. She could slip behind enemy lines and approach the blacks who were with their masters in the Confederate Army. These blacks would trust her. They might share information about the Southern Army. This information could help the Union cause. Harriet became commander of intelligence operations for the Union Army's Department of the South. Nine scouts were under her command. She was in charge of an area that went from South Carolina to Florida. Though the, black, the white men she led weren't used to reporting to a black woman, they quickly came to respect and admire her. 
Being a spy was dangerous work, but Harriet was used to danger. She used her knowledge of the rivers to help lead an invasion. On June 2nd, 1863, General Montgomery, Harriet, and about 300 black soldiers set out along the Combahee River in South Carolina. Their aim was to knock out the railroad tracks that ran by the river's edge. They also wanted to destroy the bridges that crossed it. Here they are destroying a bridge. By destroying bridges and tracks, the Southern troops could not get supplies. Without food, guns, and first aid supplies, the South could not win the war. Harriet and the others traveled in the dark night until they reached a bend. Harriet told the pilot of the boat to stop. There was a camp of Confederate soldiers nearby. Quietly, the men got out and surrounded the camp. They captured the Southern soldiers without firing a shot. More Northern gunboats came up the river. The Southern soldiers saw them and called for help. Harriet's men were too quick for them. They set fire to their food supplies and their cotton. They also set fire to their big plantation homes. Many slaves were still working on the plantations. When they saw the black soldiers, the slaves rushed to join them. The Union gunboats finally turned around and headed back. The raid was over. The Union won the battle and 756 slaves had joined their Union forces. With more and more men on their side, the Union had a better chance of winning the war. Harriet continued to lead Union troops into enemy territory. She always carried her pistol and was not afraid to use it, but she still wore a long skirt. It got in her way. However, she could not dress in men's clothes the way she had done before. Dressing in men's clothes wasn't considered proper. Ladies were supposed to wear long skirts and lots of petticoats underneath them. What a bother. Here is the, the Combahee River invasion. It's a picture of it. Then Harriet heard about Amelia Bloomer. Mrs. Bloomer had designed a sensible costume for females. The costume was made up of a small jacket, short skirt, and full trousers. Harriet wanted one. This is what she looked like in her dress as opposed to her bloomers. As she said, I made up my mind that I would never wear a long dress on another expedition, but would have a bloomer as soon as I could get it. Harriet worked as a spy for two years. By 1864, she was tired. She wanted to go back home to rest. She also wanted to see her parents. The government still owed her $1,800 for her work. Though many of Harriet's important friends, including the famous black speaker, minister, and leader, Frederick Douglass, wrote to the government for her, she was never paid the money. When she was sure her parents were well, and after she had gotten back her own strength, Harriet returned to work. She went to Fortress Monroe Hospital in Washington, D.C. There, she cared for black patients. Soon, she was promoted to head nurse. In April 1865, the Civil War ended. The Union Army had won the war. There would be no more Confederacy, but instead a single and united nation the way it had been before all the fighting. In December 1865, slavery was finally abolished throughout the United States. Not only had Harriet lived to see it, she had helped to make it happen. Constitutional Amendments. The men who wrote the Constitution in the 1700s knew that the country would change in the future. The government had to find a way to deal with these changes, so they provided a way to make changes to the Constitution. Amendments. This meant that lawmakers could vote to add certain important new laws. Since the 1700s, Congress has added many new amendments to the Constitution. These amendments reflected the changing needs and attitudes of the American people. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were all passed in the years after the Civil War. These amendments put an end to slavery and guaranteed the right of citizenship to all people, regardless of their race or color. And this was done by Abraham Lincoln. Chapter 7, Moses of Her People. Harriet went back to her house in Auburn, New York. Her parents were old and needed her. Other former slaves came there for her help too. Even though blacks were free, their troubles had not ended. And here she is back at her home. They still did not have the same rights as white Americans. For instance, blacks were not allowed to live in white neighborhoods, shop in stores owned by whites, or worship in churches that white people attended. 
shows you a store that says whites only. Black children could not go to school with white children. They went to schools just for blacks. Lots of white people would not hire black people to do a job. Many former slaves were poor or sick. They had no way to earn a living and nowhere to go. Harriet took them all in. She never said no. Harriet needed money to care for these people. How would she earn it? Help came from a white woman named Sarah Bradford. Sarah visited Harriet in Auburn. Harriet told her many stories about slavery and helping people to escape. Even though she had never learned to read or write, Harriet had an excellent memory. She remembered the smallest details, and because she had memorized passages from the Bible, the way she told these stories were filled with drama and poetry. She told about her many trips on the Underground Railroad, the war, and her work as a nurse and a spy. In 1869, Sarah Bradford published Harriet's biography. It was called Scenes in the Life of Harriet Tubman. All the money it earned would go to Harriet. That same year, Harriet married Nelson Davis. They had met when he was fighting for the North in one of the Black Brigades, and there they are getting married. Nelson was a handsome man 20 years younger than Harriet, but he had come down with tuberculosis, a disease that affected the lungs. He needed caring for too. Harriet's first husband, John Tubman, had been killed in Maryland in 1867. Harriet had never really had the chance to make a home or raise a family with him. Nelson gave her another chance. After he got better, he worked as a bricklayer. The money he earned helped support the people in Harriet's care. Harriet always had more stories to tell, and she always needed money. So Sarah Bradford wrote another book, Harriet Tubman, The Moses of Her People, and there's a picture of it. It was published in 1886. More money came from the new book, but still there never seemed to be enough. In 1888, Nelson Davis died. Harriet's parents had died a few years earlier. Now she was all alone again, but she kept working. She was already caring for several poor, old, or sick black people in her own home. But to care for more people, she needed a bigger house and more land. Not content with what she was doing, she dreamed of something bigger, a hospital and rest home for any black man or woman who needed it. Harriet earned money by raising vegetables on the land she owned and selling them door to door. Here is her garden. When she stopped at a house, she was often invited inside. Sometimes she was offered her favorite drink, a cup of tea with butter. Sitting at the table and sipping the tea, she spun her tales from the past. She would describe a Civil War battle with these words, and then we saw the lightning, and that was the guns, and then we heard the rain falling, and that was the drops of blood falling, and when we came to get the crops, it was dead men that we reaped. Or she might talk about President Lincoln, who had been assassinated in 1865 by John Wilkes Booth. She remembered how an old man had responded to the death by saying, we kneel upon the ground with our faces in our hands and our hands in the dust and cry to thee for mercy, O Lord, this evening. Sometimes she went even further back in time, telling stories she had heard in her own childhood about the old slave ships that had brought Africans to America, stories about the whips, chains, and branding irons. Another way Harriet earned money was by giving speeches. Once she was asked to speak along with the famous women's rights workers, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The two women had worked together for years. They were working to prove that women were equal to men. They also worked to get women many new rights, including the right to vote. In the 19th century, only men could vote. Harriet was a good example of how women were equal to men. Couldn't she do all the things a man could do and more? Standing in front of the audience, she said, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years and can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. Then Harriet learned that the land across from her house was about to be sold. Here was her chance. She didn't have a money, have enough money, but a bank loaned her what she needed. Now she could make her dream come true. She moved the men and women she cared for into one of the two houses on the new property. Soon, people came from all over to the house. They read about Harriet's life and wanted to meet her. 
She had many interesting visitors. People wrote to her too. She received a letter, a medal, and a black silk shawl from Queen Victoria in England. Yet Harriet still had money worries. In 1903, she turned her house over to the African Methodist Episcopal Zionist Church. She would still live in the house, but the church would pay the bills. Yet Harriet, who had never asked the people who lived with her for any money, didn't like certain changes made by the church. She said, when I gave the home over to the Zion Church, what do you suppose they did? Why, they made a rule that nobody should come in without $100. And here's a picture of people coming in. Now I wanted to make a rule that nobody could come in unless they had no money. What's the good of a home if a person who wants to get in has to have money? Harriet was an old woman now. Still, she liked taking walks through the town. When she couldn't walk anymore, her grandnieces and grandnephews pushed her in a wheelchair. There she is at the age of 92. At the age of 92, she could no longer go out, but people still came to see her. And even though she could not read herself, she still had someone read her the newspaper every day. In the spring of 1913, Harriet caught pneumonia. She knew she would not get well. With one of her brothers and some good friends at her side, she died. The town of Auburn decided to honor her. People gathered in the Auburn Auditorium. Flags flew at half-mast. Many speakers praised the work she spent her life doing. And here is the gathering. A bronze plaque was placed on the front entrance of the Auburn Courthouse in her memory. It says, with rare courage, she led over 300 Negroes up from slavery to freedom. Harriet will always be remembered for her courage, for her strength, and most of all, for her fierce devotion to the freedom of her people. And this says, in memory of Harriet Tubman, 1821 to 1913. And that concludes our final reading of who was Harriet Tubman. I hope you enjoyed learning about her as much as I did, and I hope you'll come back for our next read aloud. Thanks for stopping by, friends. My name is Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Bye-bye.